Okay, I think we're good. Chad here now? Chad, Sam. Chad is here. Oh, yeah. there he is. Yeah. Right shot of the ceiling. <laughs> like that fish phone pattern? <laughs> oh, I think it looks good. It's probably, a, it's certainly a great improvement over having to be me tonight, so... And, and, uh, hey, Chad, you might want to just mute your computer audio. You're getting a little bit of feedback. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to call the meeting of the Mashpee Conservation Commission to order for the July 23rd meeting. We have a quorum. Uh, in fact, we're, we have more than a quorum, so we should be ready to go. And it doesn't appear that we have anybody waiting with Drew to engage us in items not on the agenda. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, okay. Yeah, that's correct. So let's take a look at the pre-slash-post-hearing agenda. Yeah, so um, I'm going to table the first. Yeah, I'll table that till the end of the meeting just so we don't uh, hold up any hearings uh, if there's a discussion on that. So we'll, we'll keep that to the end. Um, but I will go to the next update, which is the Chopchak Bog uh, site visit that we recently conducted. And I'm just going to scroll down to some photos for you all to see. Give me a moment here. Okay, there we go. So um, this is the Chopchak Bog, which is associated with Santua Pond. This was uh, recently approved by the Community Preservation Act uh, for funding to purchase this bog. And we're on the cusp of a purchase and sales agreement. Uh, it's about it's a seven acre bog, and then about 11 acres total with some of the upland surrounding the bog. Um, <clears throat> just a few photos to show you. There's a couple of existing barns, barn and a pump house, uh, barn on the upper left, pump house on the bottom right, and then you can see the bog surface. It's been kept in a pretty good state of readiness, and it wasn't too long ago when it was uh, harvested. So it's uh, it's in very good shape. Um, not, you know, you can see there's not going to be a lot of uh, clearing of overgrowth when it comes time for this to be reverted to a wetland. Uh, the purpose of the site visit, and we will organize another site visit with the commissioners um, once the purchase and sale goes through, but the purpose of this site visit was to take a look at everything, uh, all the infrastructure associated with the bog, um, the sprinklers, the hoses, the irrigation, and make a decision on what is to be kept and what is to be uh, uh, taken away prior to the purchase and sales. So we did say all the sprinkler heads and, and hoses and, and PVC piping and all of that should be removed um, by the owner. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get into the pump house or the barn to see what was inside. So we're working on scheduling a day for that when the owner can provide access because everything was uh, locked up. <clears throat> so. The, we did, we were able to see inside the pump house here, and there are two pumps. One appears to be almost brand new, uh, and the other one uh, an older model. And the thought is to hold on to those um, because the division, uh, the, the uh, Department of Natural Resources might be able to use those pumps for their aquaculture program. Uh, so we decided to hold on to those, and then we'll see what else is in these buildings, and uh, depending on what we see, uh, make a final decision about what is kept and, and what needs to go. And um, so once all of that is, is done, and Board of Health has done their assessment, there's no hazardous waste or materials or dumping or anything like that. The whole property is in very pristine condition. And um, so Board of Health has signed off on it. And then once we inspect the interior of the buildings, we'll, uh, we'll make that uh, known to all the parties involved in the purchase and sale. And then I think it'll go through pretty quickly after that, and it will be eventually uh, deeded to the Conservation Commission as our newest piece of conservation land. Um, and then we'll proceed towards uh, wetland restoration after that. So um, is there anyone have any questions about that? No, has it been looked at by other uh, people uh, in terms of use, alternative use? Uh, could it be helpful to the shellfish people who are always you know, struggling with uh, what they can do to have a proper uh, headquarters, so to speak? Um, well, the Ashley Fisher, the uh, Director of Natural Resources, was there with us on site, and she was the one that mentioned okay. about the, the pumps uh, that could be useful in their aquaculture. But it's such a remote location, but it could be, Brad, that uh, that barn 
may be used, you know, at some point for some purpose for one of the departments, whether it's us or DNR. Um, uh, but it is a very remote location, and hence that's why it's been locked up like Fort Knox, because it's uh, <laughs> there's just nothing else around it. And, you know, if kids come out and they want to, um, you know, vandalize the property, there's really not a lot of people around to uh, to witness it. So um, question, you know. The question is, could it be repurposed by picking it up and moving it somewhere? I don't think so. It's a, it's an they're very very old structures, but they're in good shape. Um, but we haven't been able to get inside, like I said, so I don't know what the overall condition is. Um, but that's something that ultimately you you as the commissioners uh, will make the decision about what comes, what goes, what gets kept. You know, uh, moved around, upgraded. Um, this is you know this will be conservation land that will be under your care and custody eventually. So all of those decisions, you know, will will run by you uh, as far as what happens out here. Well, if it, if there's a need, I just say you know, it'll be interesting if you could pick it up from here and move it closer to Ashley's operation. If we had conservation land there, why not take advantage of it? If it's there, it's in reasonably good shape, which it looks like it's in good shape. Yeah. You know, there are people there are people local who pick those things up and move them to where you want them. So sure. it's something. It's an option. I've had conversations with people that do that right. here on the Cape, and it can be done. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll we'll certainly have that conversation um, with Ashley, and uh, you know, if that if the, if they can be used. Um, then by all means, I think that's that's what should happen. So, okay, yeah, good Move on to Redbrook, or are we at? Uh, oh, wait, yeah, I can I can go to Redbrook real quick because the first one is being continued. Um, so, uh, so just uh, if you haven't noticed already, if anybody hasn't seen uh, or heard about on on social media. Um, the pond that is north of Red Brook as it passes underneath Red Brook Road, which is actually a, a flooded, a perpetually flooded, abandoned cranberry bog, um, has uh, sprung a leak, essentially, and uh, there's an old sluice way water control structure next to the open arch, arch culvert that uh, is in place under the road, and we don't know if it was uh, rotted boards we know that Falmouth DPW went out there. This is right at the Falmouth Mashby town line. So they took a little bit of time to figure out who should respond first uh, to the situation, because literally Red Brick uh, itself is the town line. Um, so that got sorted out. Falmouth uh, you know, went out first to look at it. They examined uh, the culvert. I think there was some neighbors who made an initial patch on the boards, which seemed to slow down the uh, exodus of water. And then Falmouth went in, uh, kind of examined how many boards are, are there, and it's almost like seven boards deep. Um, so it's several feet down uh, that these uh, boards go down into this culvert. And it's not known if it was a rotted board or underneath the bottom board that uh, there might have been some undermining of soil. That, uh, but whatever the case is, when, when Falmouth went in most recently to, re to put some plywood in there to try and see if that would seal it up, it actually uh, made it worse, uh, and the whole thing is drained down to just the main channel and ditches of the bog. You can see the entire bog surface now. Um, so all the water has uh, leached out uh, through this situation, whatever it happens to be. Uh, it just needs to be investigated more. And as of today, Falmouth DPW and I believe Mashpee DPW uh, combined, we're putting sandbags out uh, at this control structure to try and uh, see if they could patch up uh, whatever is leaching out. I think eventually this is going to require a lot more investigation as far as what is the issue. Uh, we don't know if it's rotted boards. We don't know if it's undermining a combination of those or if there's a crack in the actual um, uh, culvert that's right next to it, the concrete culvert. Uh, so all we know is we've seen water upwelling um, on one side of the culvert opposite the pond, and so that tells us that the leak is coming somewhere underneath um, that we can't see because it's so far down, the water is very dark and murky, uh, and until things drain down to a certain point where you build a coffer dam, you're not really going to see what the issue is, and then you'll be able to be better prepared to, uh, to address it. So they're trying to do some temporary patches right now, but it is, you know, 
uh, kind of shocking to see the change from what was a flooded bog to now a completely exposed bog with water in the channels. Unfortunately, this did result in fish kills um, and all, obviously, you know, alteration of, of what was uh, a very shallow pond to now a wet meadow, uh, wetland swamp. Um, and actually, what it always was, ever since the bog was abandoned, was, an, uh, was a wetland swamp. And then over the years, it just retained more and more water and became a very shallow pond. Um, so it kind of, rather than one ecosystem being ruined, it kind of trans, transitioned from one type of uh, wetland resource area to another. Um, I think that it's unknown as far as the impact of how many fish uh, resulted in a fish kill. It's not a herring run. Uh, it's not an anadromous fish passage. So I think most of the fish were of the minnow uh, variety. Um, and then as far as terrestrial animals, uh, turtles, uh, snakes, and things like that, it's, it's estimated that they really didn't get impacted by this. The habitat probably did, but I don't think it resulted in any significant mortality of terrestrial species. Um, and the birds have certainly taken advantage of the abundance of uh, fish that were, um, that resulted from this uh, draining of the, uh, of the bog. So it is being worked on just in case you, you, know, you see it on social media or you hear about it. Um, it's being addressed and they're trying to figure out both towns, uh, you know, what to do about this in the short term and the long term, and, and we'll keep everybody updated. You'll probably see an, a new, an article in the newspaper, Cape Cod Times, uh, or the local I'm sure, paper. I'm, so. I'm sure we will, Drew. Yeah. I mean, you, all you got to do is take a look at it, because I don't, I don't leave my house until, unless I drive by that. Right. And, and algae now is happening. I mean, I think you could almost walk across that water. It is so thick with algae. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's, it's algae and it's also a lot of pond lilies and, and aquatic, uh, submerged aquatic growth, which is now exposed. So there, there's definitely going to be an odor component to this uh, with the fish kills and, and, the, uh, and the exposed vegetation. Um, I don't know, you know, if the patch is sealed, if, if the, the leak is sealed, how long it would take to uh, fill back up with water or if that's really even the goal at this point. There's just a lot of... Uh, investigating to do at this point. And I think it really would boil down to, you know, the structural stability of the culvert uh, and the control structure and, you know, future episodes of road flooding uh, or drainage and, uh, from that wetland. So there's a lot that needs to be investigated and discussed uh, as far as what the future of that particular area is going to look like. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we move on to hearings, uh, six o'clock hearing. John J. Cleary of Four Wheelhouse Lane proposed hardscape and landscape modifications. This has been continued from 7-9. Is a wetlands violation that needs to be addressed. And Andrew Garrelly from the Armand Port Design Group will, will talk to this subject. This is an RDA. Uh, it's actually, um, a, it is, oh, was it an RDA? Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this has, um, been requested to be continued once again because of the violation uh, situation. Andrew Garrelay and I met on site with the homeowner. There was some uh, pruning, significant pruning of uh, small saplings and, and shrub vegetation in the buffer zone between the rear of the house and, uh, and the water and salt marsh, um, some of it within the BBW area. And um, Long story short, the homeowner, you know, apologized for it. There was some miscommunication with the landscaper. Uh, work was done without the homeowner's knowledge. We know who the landscaper is. We've since sent out fines because he did the same thing on the property next door at 19 Waterline Drive. Um, so given the, uh, the proximity timeline of when this happened to the, to the hearing, Andrew Garrelay is going to create a, you know, a restoration plan and then include it with this particular application. Uh, and there just wasn't enough time uh, from the discovery of the violation to this meeting date uh, to get that done. So that's the reason for the continuance. And they are looking to continue to uh, August 13th at 6.09 p.m. Do I hear a motion? Hello, commissioners. Do I hear a motion to continue this from 8.13 at 6.09 p.m.? This is John. I'll, I'll uh, be happy to move to continue this to uh, 8.13 at 6.09. Second. Okay. We'll do a 
still need to do a roll call. Is that correct, Drew? Uh, you need to do a yeah, person by person uh, approval. For this. Yeah. Okay, Chad Smith, do you agree? Approved. Aye. Uh, is not here. Is that correct? Correct. Hello. Okay. Hello. Bob. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Yeah, this is Doug Mann. Yes. Okay. And this is Brad Sweet, and I will vote in the in favor as well. So the motion has carried to continue to 8.13 at 6.09 p.m. Very good. We'll move on to the 6.03 hearing of Ian and P. Alisa at Sarman at 318 Redbrook Road for proposed landscape modifications and a fence installation. Doug Knapp will be speaking to this. It is an RDA. And Doug, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, Doug, I just invited you to the meeting, so uh, there you are. I see you. Yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go okay. back up to the um, to the images I have for this. Uh, let me see. Okay. I think I got them a little out of sorts here. Hold on one second. Let me just uh, sort out the image. There we go. Okay. Okay, uh, Doug, if you just want to give your name for the record and then describe what the project is. Okay, yeah. My name's Douglas, Douglas Knapp. Uh, I'm, I, live in, uh, I live in Mashby, and this project is for my, uh, my uh, son and daughter-in-law. They own the house, and the house, since they bought it, has become pretty overgrown by brush uh, right up to the edge of the house. The house is very close to the wetlands, uh, as you can see from the plan uh, in these photos. And what I would like, they have a tick problem, uh, and what I'd like to do is to trim this brush back to uh, at least uh, provide a buffer zone between the house and the brush to try to prevent trick, you know, tick migration up to the house. And in the very backyard, there's a 30 by 38 foot lawn, a small grass lawn. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to install uh, a four foot high cedar fence around that perimeter, just in the back, and also trim the brush back, say two or three feet to allow the installation of this fence. Uh, and that would just uh, protect the kids in the backyard from brushing up against the, uh, the overgrowth, you know, the brush and so forth. So anyway, I, we're trying to do this to kind of keep the, the ticks down a little bit in the summer and allow them to use the backyard a lot more. Uh, just so the commissioners can see some of the photos I showed earlier, this is a... Uh... This is one of those lots that, uh, as Doug referred to, it, there's a lot of wetlands surrounding it. It's ACEC, it's flood zone, there's coastal bank, there's, there's wetlands. Uh, and the, a couple of these lots uh, were kind of shoehorned in as far as the, the house footprints, but not a lot of room for uh, landscaping um, around, as you can see from the, from the photos. Um, excuse me, is someone audio on the line? We can hear the background. Yeah. Background noise. <laughs> okay, she's okay, I think, I think we're good. Uh, so you can see from the images here, it's starting at the top left. Um, you've got a lot of encroaching vegetation right up against the uh, the railing on the side deck. Um, again, uh, towards the back of the house as it winds over to the backyard. Opposite side of the house, you've got branches and uh, encroaching uh, over the pathway. Um, and I'm going to scroll down. I, I kind of split up the images here. This is the backyard that Doug was referring to here. Uh, so just a little extra pruning back here uh, to kind of square off the backyard and then put the fence in. Um, so this is all pretty straightforward work. Uh, you know, it's just really creating some uh, access around the home, which has really gotten uh, encroached in pretty tight with the vegetation. So um, no impact to the values associated with any of these resource areas. And this is really, you know, when it comes to ticks and, and, and uh, poison ivy and other things, I think it's a, there's a pretty legit safety concern here. So uh, I would recommend a, a negative determination. 
Joe, sure, any idea how far away you are from Dutchman's Creek? Oh, uh, pretty far away. I, I would say more than okay. 200 feet. Okay. Well, then, they need to clean it out. I mean, yeah. it's been close to that house since they built the house. So I think That's it's correct. Yeah. worth the time to clear it out. Let yeah. them use their property. I agree. Okay. Uh, any questions from the commissioners? And nobody's called in on this one either. Just so. Yeah. Okay. So, given that, do I hear a motion? This is an RDA. I motion for negative determination. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Let's call the roll. Chad, you're up. Number one. Aye. Tom. Aye. John Schwartzbar. Aye. All? Yes, I'm okay with that. This is Brad. I'm okay with it as well. So the motion is carried for a negative determination. And Doug, that is good. A negative determination is good when it comes yes. to this. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, just a quick question. What is my procedure now? Uh, do I so, notify you? Do I do anything? Or can I go ahead and do this, this project? So, Doug, um, but uh, we just need to um, process the permit, just put, put it together, which is a fairly quick process. It should be done by Monday. Uh, Cynthia, our administrative assistant, is on vacation all week. But if you want to get started, Doug, um, before that, I, I, think, I think we're all fine with that. Uh, you know, some of the basic pruning. I would hold off on the fence uh, until you get the permit. But the pruning, you know, uh, I completely understand if you want to get that started uh, and we'll get the permit out to you as soon as possible. We'll, we either can meet you at town hall to pick it up outside the building or we'll mail it to an address that you uh, specify. Okay, no, that, sounds, that sounds good. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I okay. proceed. Thank good you. luck. Yep, thank Call you. the 606 I hearing of Stephen F. and Donna M. McDonald at 126 Lady Place Road. Proposed amendment of the order of conditions 43 2971 to allow for a coastal bank restoration and associated land cardscaping. This includes previously approved demolition, reconstruction of a single family dwelling, swimming pool, spa, septic system, and landscaping. And at the request of the applicant, this has been continued from May 28th, June 11th, and July 9th. Representative to speak to this project is Tom Bunker from BSS Design. So, Tom, you got the floor. So they, they have submitted an additional continuance request. <laughs> uh, I know that we're getting into the territory where it's, you know, um, it's getting into, uh, you know, um, you have to question why they're uh, continuing again. But I did speak to Tom Bunker. I had correspondence with him. The reason that this is being held up a little bit is because they had trouble when I was on the site last, uh, it looked like the wetlands weren't accurately delineated and they were having trouble trying to find a wetland qualified person to come in and redelineate. Uh, that has been done, but they haven't finalized the plan within five days of the meeting, which is a requirement. Uh, so abutters can see what's happening and there isn't a butter to this project that is concerned with it. So that's the reason. Um, those are the reasons, rather. Uh, so it's, it's your discretion if you want to allow another continuance. I would, I would say that you, you probably should, just given the circumstances. I, I would recommend yep. that you allow one more continuance it, and maybe some. Would this be the abutter to the south? Uh, Zamito. Um, okay. So yes, yep, to the south. south. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I would suggest that we do things absolutely according to the letter of the law. Okay. So. We'll continue to, and what uh, do you have, Drew? Yep, yeah, so this will be August 13th at 6.06 .06 p.m. The motion that we continue to August 13th at 6.06 .06 p.m. We hear a second. Second. Okay, so we have a motion to continue until 8.13 at 6.06 .06 p.m. in regards to 126 Wade Place Road. Uh, Chad, how do you vote? Aye. Oh, this this is yes, aye. I'm sorry. And then we'll move to Tom. You in aye. support? Tom? Aye. Paul. Yes. And is Brad, 
I will also vote in the favor. So the motion carries. It will be continued until August 13th at 6.06 p.m. Moving on to 609, Sharon St. Galier, 10 Shore Road Drive for proposed demolition and reconstruction of a single family dwelling with associated hardscaping, landscaping modifications, mitigation plantings, and beach raking slash beach nourishment. It's continued from 7-9 for a DEP review and a file number. Mike Ball, Marsh Matters Environmental, will speak to this. Yes, hello, uh, members of the commission, Mr. Chairman. This is Mike Ball from Marsh Matters Environmental. Um, I'm here representing Sharon Sangalier at uh, 10 Shorewood. You may recognize her name. She's one of your, uh, one of the MASH ZBA members. Um, and I am assisting her and Pete McEntee of Engineering Works, um, who did the site plans that you have, and also assisting Steve Cook, another name you'll find familiar um, from Cotua Bay Designs. He's designed the rebuild for this house. Um, this is a Johns Pond Eastern Shoreline property, uh, house built in 1970. Uh, Sharon and her husband would like to rebuild this house um, on this uh, 0.4 acre property. Um, it, it's close enough to the to the uh, to the bank and the BVW of the at this site that it, the entire property is within your jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, the the 50 foot buffer zone does extend through the house and encapsulates most of the house. Um, and therefore, um, you know, there's mitigation required because the house will be uh, larger than it is now, and they are. Okay. Uh, Mike, can I can I just interrupt for a minute? Is is anyone else uh, on the line? We can hear some background noise. Is... That's the background. Hello. Hello. Oh, it's a bad thing, Hello. Can you? Can Hello? you disconnect them, Drew? I, I I can't, unfortunately. I don't because I don't know who it is. Yep. Oh. Seems like it stopped. Oh, they heard us, I think. <laughs> okay, Mike, uh, go ahead. Okay, no, no, no problem. Um, yeah. So I, as I mentioned, the resource areas are inland bank and bordering vegetated wetland. We are uh, it, it very close to um, uh, estimated habitat of rare species associated with John. Um, uh, as I mentioned, um, because we're in the 50-foot buffer zone and we are increasing the amount of structure in that buffer zone, we are offering uh, mitigation in the form of both uh, vegetation planting and um, ecological benefits via uh, invasive species management, and specifically that uh, large gray willow, which is one of those shrubby species that you're all familiar with that are taking over a lot of the shorelines uh, of the ponds in Mashpee. Um, as I mentioned, uh, they are removing a concrete patio. They are adding on a an open deck to the rear of their house. Um, so the net increase of structure footprint is 260, 16 square feet. So a relatively small footprint increase um, over existing lawn, which is, I think, important to know. They've got um, a 5 by 8 wooden shed. Uh, that's a little bit closer to the water, and they're going to rebuild that, no, no increase in size. Um, they've got a Tupelo tree that's in the 50-foot buffer that will be over their new deck, and they just like to uh, prune that Tupelo tree up to a maximum height of 20 feet just to allow um, a little separation between the deck, which is a, which is a first floor deck, and the bottom of the tree branches. Uh, they've got an old sh uh, stone driveway. Once all construction is done, they would like to uh, restone that driveway. It might be crushed seashell, uh, but they'd like allowance to be able to add shell to that driveway. No increase in footprint. Um, also, they've got five pitch pine trees on the property, two of which are leaning, um, all of which, I believe all of which, are um, have an infestation, infestation of the black turpentine beetle. In the package you received, uh, Peter Childs uh, wrote a letter um, kind of attesting to what he observed with these pitch pine trees, and he is recommending removal of those that are, are infested. Uh, in addition to that, um, as you mentioned in your summary, uh, she's got a small beach area if, that she would like to um, be able to rake. It, it's over the, the pitch pine trees currently over the beach, 
uh, as well as some deciduous trees, and she'd like to be able to rake that beach annually um, and add sand as needed to that beach area. The beach length is probably between 40 and 45 feet. Um, it's, it's under existing trees, but you just would like to have the ability to rake it and add some beach sand um, when they feel it's necessary. Uh, that's a summary for me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Through your comments? Sure, I'll just go over some photos uh, just to further describe what Mike uh, just went over. So top left here, you can see this is the existing home. Uh, it's kind of like a little semi-peninsula that juts out into, uh, into John's Bond. So as Mike said, there's resource areas all around um, BBW Bank uh, and then bordering land subject to flooding and land under water bodies and waterways. So uh, just to give the commissioners, it's... This uh, area here at the top right uh, is kind of like what the driveway looks like. Um, so they just need to kind of formally create a, a you know a driveway uh, footprint because right now it's kind of uh, there is no footprint to the driveway. Um, and uh, along here on the bottom left, this is kind of the target area for a lot of the gray willow, uh, invasive gray willow removal, uh, and some of the mitigation. Um, the area is expected when gray willow, when you've got a thick, uh, you know, buffer like this and you take out the gray willow, it's just an open, um, you know, opportunity for native species to colonize uh, in this area. So that's expected to happen there. Bottom right, you're looking at the uh, rear of the house. This is the area where the deck, uh, the proposed patio deck would come out. And this is the tupelo tree. You can kind of see the branches here that was proposed to be pruned. Uh, just going to a couple of other photos. Looking at the shed uh, from the plan that uh, will be restored on the right here, this is the sandy beach where they're proposing to rake. You can see obviously there's a lot of uh, woody material, uh, pine needles, what have you, that get scattered on here just because of the surrounding pine trees. Uh, and then, you know, add some sand as needed uh, through a beach nourishment request as part of this permit. Um, and there on the bottom right, you can also see some of the, uh, some of the pitch pine trees, which I, I agree with Child's Arborist. Uh, they, they have uh, succumbed to um, or infested with bark beetle, uh, and they're only going to get worse, and their lean is, is right towards the house. So uh, no issues uh, with that. Uh, I'll just go back up to the plan real quick just to show you've got a couple of different uh, mitigation areas here. Uh, another one down um, near the sandy beach area, um, and uh, you know, kind of it, given the, the existing conditions of the site, it's all lawn out here, um, all kind of a predisturbed parking area here. So it's really just neatening things up at the parking lot, and getting some uh, beach nourishment on the sandy beach area, uh, and. Um, the encroachment is being mitigated for per our regulations and our calculation chart, uh, and then getting rid of some invasive species here as part of that uh, part of that mitigation for the expanded footprint. But uh, no part of this is going to impact bordering lands subject to flooding associated with John's Pond or the water quality with land under water bodies and waterways. Uh, BBW, I think, would be enhanced by the removal of the invasive gray willow. Um, so I think it meets all of the uh, all of the performance standards associated with the uh, resource areas present on the site. So no other comments. Any comments or questions from the commissioners? Uh, I've got quiet. a question. Um, how much? I know they talked about beach nourishment and bringing in sand. Is is there a limit to how much sand we would allow to go in there? Um, it's not really a limit. It's really dictated by what's essentially what's needed and trying not to go above and beyond that. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a discretionary uh, decision by the commission. So if someone comes in with a short beach area like this, I, I forgot what the amount was, Mike. What, what did they say? It was, we're asking for up to two cubic yards of clean sand. Yeah, so that that's pretty minor amount uh, okay. as far as this area goes. But we've We've seen beach nourishment out in coastal areas because it's, you know, much larger beaches, so a larger volume. So it really is predicated upon the area of beach that they're looking to nourish. But there's no uh, rules, so to speak, about how much uh, is allowable. It's, it's your discretion uh, as, as a commissioner, uh, as the commission, yeah. 
the one thing, Paul, just to elaborate on that point is that this area, uh, as Mike referred to earlier, they is subject to the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Any any portion of what we refer to as bordering land subject to flooding or land under water bodies and waterways, uh, all of John's Pond is mapped as rare species habitat, mostly for species of freshwater mussel, uh, the lamp lighter and the tidewater mucket, uh, specifically for John's Pond. So Natural Heritage, Mike, has is is the letter come back yet from them? I, I haven't received anything back from them. They, they're still inside their 30-day window. Okay, okay. So they have 30 days to comment. My guess is that because sandy, actually sandy habitat is good for the mussels, um, they don't like, they don't grow well in the gravelly substrate, uh, that it should be fine. But one of the conditions that we put into all beach nourishment requests is that we require documentation from the source of the sand to make sure it's clean and washed. Uh, and this is more so for coastal environments, but that it's also grain size compatible with what's already out there. So we, we do uh, put those conditions in automatically for every beach nourishment uh, permit. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Okay, do I hear any other questions? I'd like to hear a motion. This is an NOI, so it would be a closing issue with regard to this application. Motion to close an issue. We're here a second. Ken. Who was that that seconded? Tom. Tom, thank you. Just make sure they hear that. Okay, so gentlemen, let's uh, vote. Chad, you're up. Aye. Tom O'Neill. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Yes. And Brad will vote aye as well. So the motion has carried. Uh, good luck with the project, Mike. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you, Mike. We'll move quickly to the 612 hearing of Stephen Hines, who is the applicant for 24 Seconset Point Road. Proposed amendment of order of conditions 43-2612 to revise previously approved footprint and constructs of a single family dwelling with associated landscaping and hardscaping modifications. The owner of record is David and Anna Ferris. The representative for them is Cape and Islands engineer. So this application was just submitted a request today to be withdrawn. Withdrawn? Yeah. Do we need to uh, have a motion to withdraw? You do. Okay, do I hear a motion to withdraw? So moved. Second? Aye. Do I hear a second? Aye, thank you. Okay, Chad, your vote is? Aye. And Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Paul? Yes. And I will vote aye as well. So the motion to withdraw has been approved. Okay. And I guess we now return to pre-post hearing agenda items. Am I wrong there, True, You got something else up your sleeve? Uh, no, we are back to the pre-post agenda items. Um, okay. So I think it, we'll just move back into the discussion from last week about, um, I'll just pass it off to you all, about uh, who wants to assume or retain, um, whatever you guys decide, the positions of chairman, vice chair, and secretary. Uh, for the uh, for the new next term uh, next year. You know, for background, uh, gentlemen, you know this is a situation that uh, you know for years and years, for twenty something years, Jack Fitzsimmons, uh, your neighbor, John, uh, you know, just continued on as the chairman of the Conservation Commission, and somewhere along the line, we realized that he was in. We were, I guess, in gross violation of the town bylaws by allowing that to continue, but we love Jack and uh, so forth. But, you know, therefore, we've tried to get back to uh, going through the process that's called for in the bylaws, which is to reestablish the, the uh, organizational structure every year, and, and we're getting close to the time when the year has ending and the year's beginning, and therefore it's appropriate for us to reorganize ourselves. That's the background, Drew. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Nope. Um, 
I would just say that, uh, you know, maybe as Chairman Brad, um, that uh, you would, you know, hear any, uh, any proposals from any of the other commissioners to, and just go through the positions one at a time, Chairman, Vice Chair, Secretary, and see if uh, anyone is interested in assuming those roles. At this point, I happen to be the chairman. The vice chair is Chad, is that correct? That's correct. And Dale is the secretary. Dale is the secretary. What, simply, what I would like to see is I'd like to see somebody else step up and start to, you know, get closer to the organizational structure. Um, and, uh, and so, therefore, we do have some players that have not uh, been in this, uh, what do you want to call it, organizational structure. Uh, to add uh, some new blood, uh, at least, if not get me out of the chair. <laughs> well, maybe Chad, Brad, just as a way to uh, go. Up, you've, okay. you've, been the, you've been the vice chair for a while. You want to step up and take over this job? We'd be happy to, Brad. Okay. Well, there's, there's your first nomination. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to, to be um, considered for the vice chair if that was something that people would be interested in. I'd very much support that. That's Tom? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. this late is Mr. filling Mr. Chairman, out. I would be willing to step up and fill the secretary's position. That, that's great, Paul. We get you in the, in, in the mix here because you're well experienced. You probably can embarrass me with your knowledge of. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, sounds like we've got a slight uh, gentleman uh, of the chairman of Chad. The vice chair is Tom, and uh, the secretary is Paul. Okay. Would White. someone like to make a motion for that? Uh, and then you can do a roll call vote for, for all three positions in one motion to be made. I'll be happy to make a motion that uh, the new uh, officers for the Conservation Commission uh, are Chad Smith uh, for chairman, uh, Tom O'Neill for vice chairman, and Paul Colombo for secretary. This is John. Sounds good to me. Let's uh, do a roll call. Chad, do you, what's your vote? Need a second? Uh, you need, yeah, you need, you need a second. Okay. okay, thank you. I think I heard a second there. So let's start with the roll call of Chad. All right. Tom. Aye, Mr. Chairman. John. Aye. Paul. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I will vote for that, and my wife will support that vote. <laughs> she would. <laughs> okay. Um, there's okay. Just, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for doing that. Um, it's good. It's always good to see the kind of turnover uh, that you know, and that we do it consistently on a yearly basis. Um, you know, and start that uh, start that process and, and keep it going. So I appreciate that. And um, just a few more, just a couple of brief uh, updates from our assistant agent, uh, whom I gave the night off because it was such a short agenda. Um, so uh, just so the commissioners are aware, we're, we're having decals printed for all of our gates on our conservation lands that, uh, that say in large block and red colored letters, do not block the gate. Um, so those are being uh, printed up, and Caitlin's been great about you know making sure they're the right size and visibility. She took a tour around with the fire department to all of our gates to see which ones had the signage and which ones don't. And uh, so I think it's seven gates total. We'll use our uh, money from our lands and maintenance account to pay for the decals, uh, and then uh, Caitlin will get them all installed. Um, because we see a lot of that uh, parking in front of the gates, and it's it's nobody's fault. It's just nobody really knows uh, until they see a sign that says you can't do it, can't do it. So, um, so that'll get taken care of. If anyone hasn't uh, been out to the Jehu Pond conservation land lately, uh, the entrance there is a new entrance uh, off of Redbrook Road. Uh, it's actually Great Hay Road. It's a dirt road that kind of extends through the middle of the parcel. But now there's a, there's a gate there and a small uh, three to four car parking lot and a kiosk and soon to be a new sign. Um, so that's uh, off of Redbrook Road. 
Uh, it's actually that part of Jehu Pond Conservation Land is owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so it's it's part of the overall Mashpee National Wildlife Partnership Refuge, and they own the land on both sides of Great Hay Road in that particular location, and then you, you begin to transition into Mashpee Conservation Land the further in you go. Um, Senior Corps, uh, which is a senior version of the AmeriCorps program, uh, rebuilt pollinator boxes for our garden, and they were installed on the 22nd of this month. So we've got all new pollinator boxes uh, for our gardens, and the gardens are doing great. If anyone um, hasn't seen them recently, they really are in full bloom now. Um, there's two at Pickerel, there's one garden at Pickerel Cove, there's two gardens at Jehu Pond, and there are two gardens at the community garden site off of Route 130. So if you get a chance when you're driving by, stop by and take a look at them because they're really in uh, peak condition right now. Um, and lastly is a new pollinator garden uh, off of Great Neck Road North that was installed as an Eagle Scout project. And we may see more there, um, but uh, that was an Eagle Scout project that was recently done, kind of a grassy, uh, Little area off uh, off of Great Neck Road as you as you approach the um, as you go by the animal hospital the the uh, veterinary hospital there off of Great Neck Road North uh, you'll see it um, so uh, those are the updates from Caitlin and we just have one last thing that we're going to require in order to be discussed because it's not on the pre post agenda is just a, a recap of our site visit this morning at Willow Bend uh, with myself uh, Paul and Chad and folks from Willow Bend and Matthew Eddy from Baxter Nye Engineering. So what I need is, is a motion to discuss Willow Bend. Somebody make the motion and then go to a roll call uh, to approve that motion. So moved. So moved. So here's second. Okay. okay. I'll second the motion. Necessary. Uh, Chad, do you support this proposal? Yes, I do. Paul? Yes, I. John? I don't know what the proposal is. Oh, it's a discussion to talk about Willow Bend site visit this morning. Okay. Uh, yes. Paul? Yes. And this is Brad, I vote in favor as well. So, Drew, update us. Okay. So, uh, basically, we, we had a site visit this morning. Um, of less than a quorum of commissioners and some folks at Willow Bend, uh, golf course supervisor, superintendent, uh, the overall general manager of Willow Bend, and I think even someone higher than him uh, attended uh, this meeting, uh, got in some golf carts and took a tour around the golf course. And this was all came about because of the recent uh, violations discovered uh, in and around the golf course area uh, of Willow Bend. Uh, it started with a small, a, a, a large area of tree removal near the Santua River on one of the uh, holes, hole number three, that has since you've all been, you know, uh, informed along the along the way as, as to the compliance of that, uh, and now the new mitigation plantings are in. Uh, then there was a new, another area of um, cranberry bog that's been reverted to wetland, uh, kind of in the middle of the course. Uh, in between two parts of a, of a fairway, a one hole, um, that got cleared of several trees. That was made known to me by Matt Eddy from Baxter Nye as he was taking me on a site visit to show where they wanted to have a proposed condominium in a wooded area uh, nearby. He knew I was going to see it, so he was very upfront and honest saying and preparing me, this is something that we were shocked to see and we're going to tell you about it before we start the walkthrough. So that was the second violation. The third one uh, was one that I had discovered on another site visit uh, to meet with the golf course uh, supervisor about some pruning they wanted to do. And I had gone down to this area because I had gotten a call from someone who said that they had seen this area drastically altered and that I should check it out. So I did that before the site visit. And this was an area where Quaker Run empties out into Shoestring Bay. Um, I think it's whole, I forgot the whole number, but uh, seven or something like that. But uh, it, it, the green area backs up to uh, a coastal bank right where the river mouth empties out into the bay and uh, abuts Shoestring Bay. And trees and shrubs have been cut and pruned from that area. That appears to have happened a while back, um, but nonetheless it happened. And it's an area that was identified specifically as environmentally sensitive and not to be touched as part of the overall Willow Bend uh, development pro uh, program. So. 
that's three violations, you know, within very close timing of each other um, that I just decided to put a verbal stop uh, order on any new review of any new permits until we have this site visit today. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it on to either Chad or Paul if you guys want to just, you know, go over what was discussed. Uh, Drew pretty much hit it on the head. Uh, we saw evidence of um, recent, not so recent, and obviously mitigated for um, violations. Uh, there was a willingness, apparent willingness, to ensure that uh, to set up communication and a system for uh, ensuring this didn't happen again. Uh, we walked them through the practical um, nature of, of what to apply for, when to call Drew, and what items might be um, labeled in perpetuity with the uh, maintenance of a specific application so they wouldn't have to come back to the um, Conservation Department. Also, uh, there was uh, a good proposal, it was reiterated several times, to just delineate a map uh, of Willow Bend that shows areas around wetlands um, and different uh, water that is um, under our jurisdiction so that they know uh, they have an easy reference. Any landscaper or maintenance type can look at it and say, oh, it's in the red zone. I need to talk to my boss and they need to call the town. Uh, the only other thing I'd add is that Drew made a good point. Uh, it didn't seem like this was a flagrant disregard. It just seems like turnover at Willow Bend um, for different people and positions that have these responsibilities for groundskeeping uh, led to um, the information on how to comply and what it takes to be compliant uh, not to be passed on. So new blood, uh, learning curve, and they seem to be very willing to ensure it doesn't continue. You know, I'll, I'll chime in, and I agree with everything that Chad has to say. Uh, in an operation like this, it's commonplace. People come, people go, and it's very easy for projects to just take on a life of their own with new management, and, you know, new groundskeepers. Um, but I think it was made very clear to, I, I think the older gentleman was a, an owner, I'm not sure, yeah. but certainly the manager who was nice enough to chauffeur me around in his cart, um, <laughs> that they need to call Drew on just about anything they're going to do. What, I would really like to see the comprehensive map with these red zones for every area that we have jurisdiction over. And anything that comes into those areas or comes close to them, they, they know who to call and they know that we're going to be watching. Right. Yeah, so that, that pretty much sums up what, uh, you know, the purpose of today's meeting was, what was discussed and what was the outcome. Um, and, and just so everybody knows what, what my recommendation is and, and what I believe they are going to do is to file a notice of intent that will have a comprehensive, you know, communication framework and management plan for the course, all areas of the course under wetlands jurisdiction, and then create a plan that actually shows those areas of wetland jurisdiction, highlights them, uh, whether it's through cross-hatching or what have you, and that can be, you know, a, a constant reference point for all staff and turnover of staff so they have something, you know, permanent to, to look at, uh, an easy reference tool uh, so that they know when they're in jurisdiction and when they're not and when to call us and when to not, um, you know, and communicate with us. So I think we're all on the same page there. Um, I think it was a good, you know, meeting overall. And um, one of the things that I wanted to get a feel for the commission, because I know the supervisor has a couple of projects right now. Um, some of them are, you know, routine maintenance. Some of them involve a little more scope of work. Specifically, I think that there, were, there were two that he raised that he wanted to find out if could be dealt with before this notice of intent is finalized and reviewed by the commission. Um, and, and I'll certainly get more information, you know, from them as a specific, uh, specificity of work. But one of them was like dealing with root, exposed roots on cart paths that are within wetlands jurisdiction. And the other one was a particular fairway, uh, hole nine or bog nine as they call it. Um, that's an elevated, a couple of elevated T's, um, and uh, the Quaker Run is down in a ravine with some trees coming up on both sides uh, that's kind of closing in the gap of the fairway from those elevated tees. Um, their concern, their biggest concern is safety, that there's a couple of tees down below um, that are semi-hidden from view from those who are teeing off above. 
and uh, and it's a safety concern uh, for the staff and, and for golfers. So um, it is a resource area. It's riverfront uh, in this area. Um, but uh, in what we discussed today, they're looking at doing not tree removal, but tree topping uh, to reduce the, the height of the trees. So I, I wanted to, because I told them, I said we would be discussing overall the site visit tonight. And uh, I would bring those two particular requests to the commission to see if you as the commissioners would be okay with them proceeding with that uh, until the notice of intent comes in for all you know, future maintenance. So just wanted to put that out there. It's your decision. I didn't tell them one way or the other, you know, where I was leaning because uh, I just felt it was best to, to have you guys, you know, um, discuss that. To add to what Drew just said, and I speak for myself, Paul can certainly uh, add his own um, opinion, um, agreeing or otherwise. Uh, I w I'm in favor of, as Drew proposed, letting them proceed with some of the smaller items uh, that was mentioned, uh, particularly the tree topping. Uh, the body of water it's around, as Drew pointed out, is not a habitat for herring. Um, keeping it shaded is not a... a, a is not really going to be impacted. It might actually be improved as the trees start to grow out rather than up. And I think it's um, that particular project has merit. Uh, you know, as luck would have it, today when we were there, uh, there were a couple of, uh, I don't know what you call the parties of golfers uh, that were down below. So we could clearly see the safety issue. Right. Uh, so for that alone, I'd be in favor of topping. Although what came up in the conversation was the topping of the pines. Right. It can't be topped. So, it, right. you know, I don't know how it, would they propose to us X number of trees, certain numbers being pine that would be removed? I, I don't know how that plays Yeah, so what, what I would do with, with the commission's blessing um, is I would request, a, you know, specific information about exactly what they're looking to do. And then we can work with their staff, you know, saying, okay, well, this works, this is fine. This has, this is not going to work, you know, if they're topping pines or, or something like that. I mean, the, the overall goal is to increase the safety uh, of the situation. So that's what we'll, we'll do in communicating with them uh, on this whole pruning uh, of vegetation. If we see something that's just really not necessary for safety improvement, uh, we'll point that out. And if, if, uh, if an entire pine needs to come down, um, you know, uh, if it really is part of that uh, safety concern, then, you know, we'll proceed uh, with authorizing it. But it'll be carefully vetted, you know, yep. um, for that. Yep. Um, one other, it's, a, I guess, a comment, maybe a question. Um, Craig, who was, uh, I, I think he was the manager of the complex. He was driving the cart yep. that I was in. Yep. Um, he had mentioned uh, the cart paths and the roots as we were going over them. Mm -hmm. And he also mentioned a, a friend or somebody who knew that was in the asphalt business and they were thinking about bringing in recycled asphalt to use on those cart paths. Is that something we're okay with or do we determine what type of material they do with that? I think we would just you know, look at uh, how they're gonna use that material. Um, I can tell you from my own experience with that recycled asphalt, We've used it on some of the dirt roads and conservation lands that have become so badly rutted uh, that that, you know, helped to stabilize them. And um, it hasn't resulted in any sort of adverse impacts from leaching out of chemicals or anything like that. So as long as it's kept in the footprint, it's contained, maybe like a, you know, steel edging uh, on the sides or something like that, um, you know, to prevent it uh, from falling apart or making its way into the wetlands. But from what I saw today, it looked like those cart paths were, you know, far enough away from the actual Quaker run in that area that I don't think it would be impactful to use those materials. Okay. But we can, again, you know, we'll, we'll vet it out. Yep. Okay. Okay. So it's not anything that Any? you guys would need to take an official vote on. It's just I just wanted to get your pulse on, the, uh, on that request. And then I'll, you know, we'll, we'll proceed to gather up all the information and, uh, and, and keep everybody, you know, informed about what they're doing with those two particular projects, if that's acceptable. Absolutely. Thank you, Drew. Good report, guys. That was, uh, must have been an interesting uh, visit. Badly that I got conflicted and couldn't make it. Yeah, Brad.
glad you missed out on a beautiful lunch and uh, Bloody Marys. <laughs> I had three of them. Is that right? Well, yeah, not really. <laughs> when I got home. <laughs> Just wanted oh. to make you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, not a problem. Uh, anything else to come before the commission this evening? Brew, well, anything else? That's it. Uh, it's, I thought Dale was going to be here tonight, but I, you know, we're planning on doing something to to uh, recognize his service to the commission, and uh, hopefully he's still here on Cape Cod and hasn't moved out yet. Um, but we want to have some sort of you know something, just a token of appreciation from us, from our department, uh, for his service to the commission. So we'll we'll keep everybody informed on that and uh, come up with something nice uh, for Dale as a parting gift. <laughs> A lovely parting gift. <laughs> okay, sounds like a sounds like a good deal. I I just got the impression he and I exchanged some emails after the last meeting. I got the impression that he was going to get out of town real fast. That wasn't going to be here tonight, but that okay. was my impression. Yeah, well, we'll find out. I mean, uh, Caitlin called him yesterday and and he said he was going to be here, but uh, it's fine. We have wow, a forum, okay. so yeah. But. Okay. Do I motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for your help over the uh, whatever it's been year or so that I was the chairman this time around. So, thanks for your support, and we'll be uh, seeing you down the road in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Drew. Good job, Brad. Take care.